All right, let's dive into the next one. <clears throat> Thinking habit number five, what is it? Thinking about thinking. Remember, there are two places where the leader can stand. Where are they? On the field, in the stands. What are the benefits of being on the field? You know exactly what it means. You're not just an armchair, you know, theoretician. You know the reality of the work. What else? Action. You're taking action. What else? You're leading by example. Yeah, that's a beautiful part of being on the field. You're not just telling people from a distance. You're going first. Good. What else? You're caring for the people. You're connecting with them, caring for them, encouraging them, inspiring them. You're shoulder to shoulder with your people, yeah? Making mistakes and learning from them. You personally are making mistakes and learning from them. Very nice. Very nice. You're learning from them too. You're learning from them too. And also, you're right there next to others. You're, you're learning from others' mistakes as well. Uh, and that's really cool. You know, that's a whole lot cheaper yeah. than learning from your own. Yeah. It's less costly. You're in the middle shaping the culture. Excellent. You're acting. You're moving. We're moving together. You're helping those on your team to move. Very good. What are the benefits of being up in the stands? You see everything. You see the big picture. Yeah. What else? You see the patterns. You see the patterns. Yeah. Patterns. Patterns. I love patterns. Who likes patterns? I love patterns. I love them. I love that. I'm just seeing how things fit together. And, and, but to do that, you have to be up in the stands. Yeah, you, you can't see the pattern when you're in the in the rough and tumble of the, the field, yeah? You see the mistakes up there. Yeah, very clearly, it's all clear. Down here, it's like, well, whose fault was that? Mine, yours, who knows? Up in the stands, you see exactly what happened. What else? Up in the stands, benefits. You encourage, you're cheering them on. Bal? You... You reflect? Reflection. Reflection, yeah. That's what, that's essentially, in our application of this field stands metaphor, that's essentially what we do up in the stands. We pull out of the, the struggle, the battle, the race, and we get up in the stands and we reflect. What's happening? Why is it happening? What's going well? Why is it going well? What's not going well? Why? How can we improve it? That kind of stuff. That's what happens in the stands. Evaluation. Reflection. Evaluation. You're thinking about the thinking. You're getting up outside of yourself. And you're saying, all right, how am I thinking about this right now? Why did I just do that? Yeah? So this includes... Um, yeah, questioning your own thinking, questioning your own motives, uh, and a dependency on God to guide the way that you're thinking. Yeah? So remember number one, thinking habit number one. What is it? Yeah. So we're looking at God. We're asking Him to give us accurate reflection, accurate evaluation of what's happening, accurate deep insights into what's happening. Look at the, the third passage on page 47, the third one down, Proverbs 14, 15. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. He's thinking about his thinking. Is that cool? This is what healthy leaders do. Uh, in our training programs, 
we evaluate all the time. We get up in the stands all the time, like literally all the time. In the middle of the learning, we'll stop and say, hey, let's get up in the stands. What just happened? Why did we do it that way? What was the response? Why, was, why, was, uh, why did that response happen? How can we improve it all the time? At the end of the week, uh, the teams will evaluate the leader, the team leaders. They all will evaluate the cohort leaders. Uh, the participants will evaluate the learning design. Constant evaluation, uh, a lot of self-evaluation. We weave evaluation through everything that happens in the training. And after months in a program like this, guess what they then do for the rest of their lives? We've built in this deep habit. And hopefully all 10 of them, uh, we intentionally try to do that, weave it all through. Uh, but this one in particular, healthy leaders are continually evaluating. All right, team assignment. In your teams, two opposites and two dark sides. High quality. Must be high quality or we will laugh at you. Great. All right. We're working on thinking about thinking, um, constant reflection. Healthy leaders constantly reflect. This also is a key characteristic to look for in emerging leaders. Look for those who are reflective. They don't just keep barreling on, you know, stubbornly in what they're doing, but they pause to reflect. Remember the Lord Jesus. Constantly, he got up in the stands. Uh, in Luke, Gospel of Luke, as I mentioned yesterday, I think it's 11 or 12 times, it is specifically mentioned that he came away from the crowds and went into a solitary place or in the mountain or somewhere, him and God. And this is what he was doing before God. He was connecting deeply with his father, listening to his father, loving his father, reflecting what's happening, what's been going on, where are we going. Uh, and if there are 12 specific mentions of Jesus doing that, you know it happened more. Yeah? yeah? So he was constantly, constantly coming aside to reflect. If Jesus needed to constantly come aside to reflect, who are you that you don't? Yeah? And so this is, it's a major thinking habit of the healthy leader. We're working now on opposites and dark sides. So please, each, each table will have two very high quality of each or else you have my official promise <laughs> you will be laughed at <laughs> all right there's nothing worse than that is there we're huh? ready. We're ready. you're ready all right we're, this, we're tough we're tough we can handle it the challenge all right back table please uh, yeah overthinking good overthinking that'll be a dark side isn't it Overthinking. Yeah, where, where we, we stay up in the stands. Yeah? We end up disconnected from the work itself. Good. That's a good one. No, no laughter here. High quality. <laughs> Sorry? Too many thoughts. Wandering thoughts. Wandering thoughts. Ah, great. So it's not high quality reflection. It's daydreaming. We're just daydreaming, just thoughts going around and around. It's not productive. It's not high quality. Yeah, very good. Very good. Would you call that an opposite or a dark side? It's a dark side. So we're reflecting, but it's the wrong kind of reflection. Good. Also, escape solution. How many from there? You are thinking of something else. That is escape solution. Maybe you have a morning problem. You go and watch television. Your thoughts. Oh, escapism. Yes, escapism. Yeah. 
Okay, so you're pulling apart from the work, but you're just going watching TV. You, you're just escaping from the pressure. Hey, I need a break. I need a time of rest. But you're not actually connecting with God. Yeah, can we call that an opposite? Yeah, escapism. Escapism. Under the guise of reflection. Good. Good ones. Very good. Good. Next team, please. How about this team? Yo, yo, your team. Worsty. Focus on yourself. Can you say a little more? I'll be focusing on yourself and then thinking about what the other people will do. Intimidated by the thoughts of others. Okay, okay. Great. Ah, thoughts about yourself. Do you mean like self absorption? Yeah, that's a good one. That, that, that's, a, that's a dark side, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah, we end up just absorbed in, you know, in ourselves. Again, it's not a high quality reflection, is it? Uh, and also, uh, the second one you said was thinking about what others are thinking. So we're not really looking at it from God's perspective. We're just under pressure from the thoughts and opinions and feelings of others. Is that it? Yeah, great. Very good. Very good. Who's next? How about you guys? Mary? Okay. We have reacting. Reactive. Reactive. Can you say more? Give a description. So instead of acting, you're reactive. reactive. So it's reactive. Yeah. Yeah. You're just reacting to what's happening. Uh huh. So things happen and we just react automatically. We're not reflecting. Instead of, so this is opposite. Instead of reflecting, we're just reacting. Good. Got it. And second one is impulsive. Impulsive. Being impulsive. Yes. Yeah. Again, there's no thinking about my thinking. I'm just, I, I'm staying on the field, aren't I? And I'm just engaging in the work and responding impulsively. Good. Dark sides? Yeah, good one. Yeah, we become passive. Paralyzed. Paralyzed by? What paralyzes us? The challenges. Get hung up in your thoughts, circular thinking. You get paralyzed. Unable to find, act. You don't find the exit route. No exit route. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Good, good. So we're up on the stands. We're just running in circles. The dog is chasing his tail up in the stands. Yeah, yeah, good. Instead of having a profitable reflection and then getting back in the... Yeah, good. And to add another opposite for my group, you become a relic stuck in the past because you're not upgrading, you're not thinking. Yeah, good. You become a relic. Just stuck in the past. Just stuck in the, the same the same stuff. Just keep doing the same stuff the same way, yeah? Because we're not reflecting. Good. Very good. Who have we this team? God, uh, that's not me. I don't I don't think I'm a doer. I'm not a thinker. That's not for me. That's for other people. I'm a doer. Excellent. Too busy to think. So many Christian workers are, are exactly like this, aren't they? I just do what I'm told. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do, how to think, and I'll do it. Ministry machine. Yep. Yeah. And many. And often, 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 look, um, we should not be negative toward those people because often that's how they've been trained. They've been trained. You just do what we tell you to do. Uh, I remember years ago, I was with the top leadership team of two of the national network. And I don't know if you were there, Mary, um, two of the ones, the ones that are in the same province. And, and they were saying, please, we need you to help us with leader development. All right. We had about half a dozen people in a room, about three of, from each of these networks that they had a close relationship at that time. And they're saying, please, will you help us both with leader development? We need to build our leaders. And my response was, I'm going to say it very bluntly to you. To them, it was very polite, you know, of course. 
But to you, bluntly, what I said was, are you sure you want to build leaders? Because if you build leaders, they're going to challenge the status quo. They're going to question the sorts of things that you've been doing and why have you been doing them and how have you been doing them. If you build leaders, you're going to be building people who have the capacity to think and explore and challenge. Uh, perhaps what you actually want to build is um, <coughs> machines, robots, ministry machines on the production line who just do the same thing the same way and churn out the production. Uh, in a very nice way, I, I said that to them. You know, are you sure you're asking for leader development here and not just building machines? And it's a profound question. And honestly, at that time, there was at least a little bit of wanting to build machines. <laughs> well, we're, we're not going to be the right ministry for you <laughs> if you want to build machines. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> evaluating others and not yourself. Goodness me. That's a, that's a heavy one. Anybody feel uh, convicted? <laughs> Good. This team? Procrastination. We never get around to doing anything. We're just always going to keep evaluating and evaluating. Good. We've got to get back on the field and move. The opposite is we do not have discernment because members are doing so little. Uh, that's the opposite. Lack of, discernment. Lack of discernment because we're never coming aside to reflect. Good. Excellent. Oblivious. Jacob? Oblivious. 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 Can you explain that? Not actually being aware of what is happening. Oh, wow. Oblivious. Oblivious. So you may reflect, but you're not, you're not really aware of... It's not, a, it's not a good quality reflection. You're oblivious to the reality of what's happening. Good. What else? What was the... F yeah? Over-analytical. Over-analytical. Yeah, overthinking. Yeah, good. Good. Yeah, yeah. Never yep. Sure. Yep. Just constantly doubting yourself. This is the dark side. Where we constantly doubt, never sure. Yep. Being negative toward ourselves. Yeah, good. Very good. Where can we put negative? Stupidity. Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Stupidity works for all ten of them. You know, if you want to. If you want a nice, easy answer, just <laughs> stupidity, man. <laughs> oh, last team here. Lennon. That said could be like subjective thinking leads to misadaptation. So we think, but all confused. Yeah, confused, subjective uh, thinking, and which leads to misinterpretations. Yeah, yeah, dark side, just subjectivity. That's the opposite. All we do is do. Yeah, we stay on the field. We never get in the stands. Yeah, good. Confused. <coughs> Confusion. Overthinking. We end up confused, unable to move, paralyzed by the an analysis paralysis. Yeah. We also end up as a skeptic. We end up as a skeptic because of too much. Too much of contemplation, yep. thinking, and yep. skeptic, not believing in anything. See the fault in everything. Yeah. See, see the potential flaw in everything because we're just thinking down, well, this could go wrong. Oh, well, this could go wrong. We just reject everything then. Too much thinking. That's great. Self-condemnation. Self and Yanami? Satisfied with the status quo. If you are satisfied with the status quo, you might not even think. Yep. Satisfied, that's an opposite. Yep, satisfied with the status quo because why do I need to evaluate? It's fine, everything's great. Yep, good. This is great, very high quality work. Fantastic. Give yourself a hand. Wow. Excellent. And let's move on to the next one. Oh, this is a beauty. I love this one. I love them all, actually, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> 
when I talk to you about, well, I think I'm a specialist in this, and you stress that we need to cultivate all of these. These need to uh -huh. all of our characters. Yeah. So yeah. You said I love them all. It's not arrogant and surprise that you're saying that. Oh, no. Sure. No, I wasn't thinking about my model. Yeah. yeah. The value of it is in the holistic, yeah. collected uh, accumulation of all of these patterns of thinking. Yeah. The, yeah, that's great, Jim. Uh, uh, what Jim just said was that uh, we need to not think of ourselves as I'm a specialist in this one or, or, or these two. I'm really good at that. I'll leave the others for others. <laughs> no. Uh, all of us need to be working on all 10 of these. Every leader needs to be working on all 10 of these. Remember my suggestion yesterday, take one of these, spend a week. Uh, uh, later today, we're going to develop four dynamic charts for each of them. So that will give us some very clear direction on how to nurture these. All of these can be nurtured. So as you look at one and you say, wow, that's, I'm really weak in this area, your response should not be, well, that's just me. I'm weak in this area. You know, so, but I'm strong in others. No, you need to work on it. All of these, every one of these 10 will directly improve the quality of your leadership. Directly will impact the daily quality of your leadership. Every one of them will. These are really powerful. Please don't treat this just as a, a laundry list of nice things. These are powerful realities of the internal world of the leader. Change these things, your life will change, your leadership will change, your team will change. The quality of your work, the impact of your work will very quickly change. The, the quality of your relationships with others will be improved. Yeah? We must work on all ten. Not at the same time. You can only work on one at a time. <laughs> So do them one week at a time. And in a couple of months, you will see a difference. I promise you. Money back guarantee. <laughs> All right. Embracing ambiguity. Uh, I find this one just really fascinating. Um, because leadership, leadership is absolutely saturated with ambiguity. And when we understand this, and then we're able to respond to this well. It's fantastic. It is so liberating because on some of the ambiguities, you've been hitting your head against it, trying to figure it out. And when you recognize this is just an ambiguity, this is the reality of it. I will never figure this out. And so I just need to move ahead anyway. It's extremely liberating. I remember years ago, it was oh, 35 years ago, no more, it was almost 40 years ago, very soon after I was a believer, and I, I came into the whole issue of sovereignty of God and responsibility of man, right? And of course, when I came to Christ, I was totally responsibility of man. And I, I didn't even believe in God, you know, so I certainly had no sense of the sovereignty of God. Um, and, but then I began to look at the scriptures and there is a God and he's actually in charge and he's the sovereign Lord of the heavens and all of that. And it was like, wow, but I was still very much on responsibility of man. But I began to look more and more deeply at it. And then one day I had this crisis when I recognized God actually is sovereign, which then led to another crisis. Well, does that mean I'm not responsible? I mean, I, I actually went for weeks on this. I was in an a existential crisis over this. Uh, they weren't just doctrines to me. I mean, this is reality. This is life. And, and then, by the grace of God, I actually discovered this place where I could believe both at the same time. God is the sovereign Lord of history, and man is fully responsible. But how could that be? Because don't they contradict each other? Yes, they do contradict each other. Nevertheless, they're both true. And I was absolutely liberated. I was liberated from it. I was like, wow. And, and, and I don't understand why people want to choose one or the other. You can have both. Think about it. You can have the benefits of both. What are the benefits of believing in the sovereignty of God? What are the benefits? We rest in, yeah. Man, if everything's up to me, oh, the world's sunk. I'm sunk, yeah? So I can rest in His 
anxiety, fear, worry. I'm delivered from this because God is in control. Um, so we're talking about the sovereignty of God, how that we, 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 we have these two realities. The scripture teaches both. And when you embrace, here's the thing about ambiguities. When you embrace both sides, you get the benefit of both. So we were talking about the benefits of uh, sovereignty of God. How about the benefits of responsibility of man? What are some of those? When you fully embrace that truth, what are the benefits? Action. Dil you're diligent. Obedience, right living. Yeah, you obey God. You don't just say, oh, well, I'm... You know, I confessed Jesus as my Lord one time 50 years ago, so I'm fine. But you walk with God. You make your calling and election sure, yeah? It's an empowerment. It empowers you to be a co-creator with God. Sure, yeah. You've got a solid walk with God. Yeah. Yeah, we work with God. We recognize we're co-working with God and His great purposes. We take responsibility, right? We act. Sorry? Make wise decisions. We have a passion for the lost. We're not fatalistic. We say if we don't reach them with the gospel, they won't be reached with the gospel. What is the problem if you've only got the sovereignty of God? If, if you go to that side, what are the potential? You won't do anything. Why? It's all God. He'll do it all. Doesn't matter what we do. We can't change anything. It's going to happen just as God ordained that it's all fixed. Nothing I can do. Fatalism. Stop. Why pray? Why on earth pray? God's going to do what He's going to do. Why on earth share the gospel? You, you remember the story of who was William Carey when God moved upon his heart to go to, where did he go first? It was India, right? India. Went to India. So he went to the, to the whoever it was, the Baptist thing that he was a part of and he said I want to go to India and, and, and their response was if God wants to save the heathen he will do it without your help that's what they told him now thank God he went anyway and birthed the entire modern missions movement uh, but that's the that's when you see see what happens when you go to one to one instead of holding the second what happens, though, if you go to the other extreme? Well, I don't believe in the sovereignty of God. That's just fatalism. That's just passivity. So I, I'm going to embrace this. What then? Works. Works religion. My salvation depends on me, my own self-effort. The purposes of God for the earth depends on us. Oh, my goodness. What a heavy burden that would be. Yeah. And so we hold both at the same time. See, then you get the benefits of both. That's the beauty of, of this way of thinking, of embracing ambiguity. It's absolutely fantastic, especially when it comes to these doctrinal issues. It's fantastic. You embrace both. You have the benefits of both. You know, people argue about, uh, do I have eternal security in Christ? Or do I have to endure to the end to be saved? Do I have to endure to the end? And what's the answer? Both. They're both true. Uh, you know, and this is a massive division in the church. This one issue has, has, has separated uh, probably millions of believers, deeply separated, deeply divided over this doctrinal issue. What a tragedy. Wow. And... And, and do you really, do you, have you ever thought of why people take such strong positions on either side? It's because they're both taught in the Scripture. They both have their proof texts. They're, so they've both got, well, the Word says this. Well, the Word says this. Well, thank you. The Word says this. I've got them both. I get the benefits of both. Thank God. In, in thinking about this idea of ambiguity, uh, I don't like to use the word balance. And usually that's the first thing people think of, right? Uh, in ambiguities is balance. But watch this. When you're thinking of balance, then it, 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 it's the idea that you can, 
It's the idea that you can achieve a static state like a, uh, what do you call them, seesaw? seesaw. Yeah. A seesaw, like a seesaw, you know? And so if it's out of balance, then you take a little bit from, from where? From here, and you put it here, right? So a little less of this, a little more of this, and then we can achieve this static place. Do you understand? Instead, use the word tension. It's a whole different image, and it is much closer than the reality. Because in these ambiguities, you will never achieve the perfect static state where everything is just fine, where, where, where I've got it all set. You won't. And so in attention, you're being pulled. You're being pulled by this. You're being pulled by this. And inevitably, you will move too far over here and it will be appropriate. You know, sometimes in situations, we need just to dive into the sovereignty of God, don't we? And forget about the responsibility. We just need to soak in God. So we, so we, we go over here. It's, it's good. It's legitimate. It's healthy. But then, of course, we need to come back here. In other situations, when we're being tempted by sin, we need to throw ourselves into responsibility of man. Yeah? Don't do it. Rather than, oh, God will keep me. You know, <laughs> No, just don't do it. And, and so we're, you know, do, do you understand? And, and so the tension... It's a dynamic state. It moves. It's not a static place that you achieve by a little less here, a little more there. Is that cool? Also in attention, you've got 100-100. Yeah. In the balance, you've got 50-50 or 60-40 or whatever it is to make that work. So you're fully embracing both sides of the tension. It's a really powerful idea. Um, and also, so there are sometimes you need to legitimately go to one side or the other, and, and then later on you'll correct it. Sometimes, illegitimately, we go from one side to the other. You know, it, we, we just get tangled up in something. We end up out of, out of whack. Uh, and, and then we need to realize, oh, I need to come back into tension. Is that cool? Uh, do you understand the difference between balance and, and tension? Uh, it's a great way to think about it, especially one of the uh, a major uh, tension in leadership is family or ministry work. It's a major tension that all leaders struggle with because we have the responsibility, uh, really big responsibility for both. And we do, at times we do go uh, a lot too far toward the ministry side. Then we need to catch that. And then say, all right, I've got I to gotta come back here. And so then give more attention, you know, to family to try to make up for it. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So, so think about that, uh, um, especially when, it, when it's like ministry family. That's not a balance. You don't achieve a balance. That is a tension. You, you'll never achieve a static state where, where you just figure out how to do it. You know, try to get it in your schedule or something where from, you know, <laughs> From two to four, I do this, and that just, that, you can try that if you like. And, and if you think you can accomplish that, God bless you. But the reality is, in complicated, difficult, demanding leadership responsibilities, you will not achieve that state. You will go back and forth out of a place of one to the other, and you've just got to recognize that and constantly adjust. When, when you think it's going to be balanced, you're going to end up feeling guilty because you're never going to achieve it. And, and, and this idea of balance is that you were just really a healthy leader. You would find this beautiful, comfortable, polite, orderly place of balance. Ministry is not orderly. Leadership is not orderly. It's not. Look at the Lord Jesus. Think of this image. It's my favorite image for this. The disciples are rowing in the storm. The boat is battered. Where is the Lord Jesus? He's with them. Where is he? He's sleeping. He's sleeping on one of these boats. You ever seen him? The bottom of this boat. I mean, how do you sleep in the bottom of that boat, even if it's completely still? Number two, it's in the middle of a storm that they think is going to kill them all, drown them all, overcome the boat. It's a major storm and he's asleep. What does that tell you? What does it tell you? 
He is absolutely exhausted. That's what it tells us. He's exhausted. Yeah? See, he didn't have this nice, neat, little balanced life. And, you know, I'm always in bed at the right time. And if you're able to do that, man, do it. I'm so jealous of you. Uh, I, I, I wish I could too. And I, I, I don't deny you that. You know, if you can do that, do that. But most of us can't do that. It's just the nature of our responsibilities. Yeah? Uh, and so this is, this is the reality of, of, of leadership. It's really messy. It is really, really messy. It is really hard work. That's my model of leadership. Leadership is messy. It's messy. It's, it's a mess. Jesus' ministry was a mess from our perspective. From the Father's perspective, of course, perfect. Yeah? No criticism. But it was a mess. It was this and then that and then the other and so many crowds they can't even eat. You remember in the early chapters of Mark? They, could, they couldn't even find time to eat. Not even to eat. Wow. This is the reality of leadership. But if I think that leadership is this balance that I can find, if I would just figure out a little less here, a little more there, I'm going to live in a constant state of turmoil and guilt because I'm, I'm failing. I failed to achieve this place of balance. Is that cool? So embrace tension. This is the reality. What's the first task of the leader? Face reality. Face reality. This is the reality. And, and this is the reality of the leaders that you serve. So please don't go to them and act like everything is so straightforward because we have these beautiful models and if you'll just follow these models, everything will be perfect. No, it won't. It won't change the fundamental messiness. They'll be able to do better in the middle of the messiness, but it won't change the messiness. Is that okay? I mean, really empathize with the leaders that you serve. Um, really get in their world. Really feel their world. Don't just have quick solutions for them. You know, well, this will fix everything if you'll just do it. No, it won't. Because there are a thousand other things that you're not even aware of that they're struggling with. And if they're not struggling with them today, they will be tomorrow. Yeah? This is where leaders live. This is the reality. And, um, and so it's okay. So we embrace this idea of tension. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need to call it embrace the messiness. But, um, yes. Uh, the, the theological one was great. Can you think of a couple really practical... Oh, we're, I'm about to give you a list of them. I'm about to give you a, a whole list. Uh, I actually collect them. <laughs> Seriously, um, I, I literally have a list. I collect leadership tensions uh, as I realize them and come across them, as I hit my head against them. Every one of them I've hit my head against with the bruises to show for it, you know? Yes? Okay, I will be size. of God and also talks about responsibility of man. So obviously it's not a problem for us. It's not a yes. to him. Amen. It's Amen. Ambiguous to us, but, we, but because we are created yes. unity being and so our intelligence or our you know thinking capacity is limited. Yeah. So we cannot figure it out. But God doesn't require us to yes. figure it out. Amen. He it requires us to believe and to work in it. Yeah. So that's why it, it doesn't bother him. Um, yeah. And uh, so we need to humble ourselves before God. Yes. And embrace uh, <coughs> both parts of it. Amen. Amen. Yeah, great. That's good. Yeah, humble ourselves before God. Again, we're, we're just trying to be in control, aren't we? When we're trying to figure it out when we're trying to achieve this place of, quote, balance, yeah? We, we're thinking, we really think we can. That's the problem with us. We really think we can achieve a place of balance, and we can't. Yeah, so we trust God. He, it's not ambiguous to Him. He's not bothered by it at all. He sees exactly how it all fits together. It all makes perfect sense to Him. So trust Him. It's His work. It's His plan. It's His purpose. It's very liberating. Um, yeah, so here's the thing about tensions. We don't like them. They're uncomfortable. And so we try to resolve them. 
Sometimes we're in tensions that can be resolved. That's fine, then do it. But many times it can't be. So embrace the tension. Now let's look at specific, this is on page 52. Let's look at some specific examples of leadership tensions. We'll start with my, my, my favorite one um, of these. And this is, uh, when we started working in, uh, in leadership, uh, leadership and leader development, and I began to realize, and as also as I studied culture, and I began to realize that view leadership through an entirely different lens. In the Western world, leadership is very much about change. The leader is change agent. The leader challenges the status quo, sets the direction, aligns the people, helps them to move to achieve that direction, right? Amen. That's great. I believe that's very valid. I teach that. You know that. The leader is fundamentally a social architect. There's a, uh, a phrase, correct me where I need to be here, there's a phrase uh, that speaks about leadership using the image of the collar and the sleeve. And it's the, you know, le collar? Collar and, collar and cuffs? Collar and cuffs. You think, well, what's that got to do with leadership? Well, the idea is when you get the collar and the cuffs right in the shirt, then everything will hang properly. So it's the idea of harmony. It's the idea of everything in its place. In Confucian, the foundation of Confucian culture, uh, the foundation is harmony. That's the goal, is harmony. And so the leader is a social architect. He, uh, uh, th there's, his, his purpose is to have everything in its right place and working in harmony. There's another cool image, speaks of the leader holding a bowl of water in his hand without dropping, uh, without spilling a drop. Yeah? It's quite hard to do, actually. Try it. You know, fill a bowl up with water and, you know, walk along without spilling a drop in, in one hand, yeah? It's quite hard to do. Um, and and uh, that's the role of the leader. In other words, there's no... 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 There's no favoritism. We treat everybody the same. So no one's upset because, you know, well, you treated him this way and me that way. Uh, this idea again of harmony. Yeah. It's fascinating. And, and uh, years ago I thought, all right, what does that mean for helping with leader development in teaching fundamentally Western models of leadership and management? Uh, and yet, the way that the Westerner is even understanding the nature of leadership is completely different. Fascinating, huh? Mm -hmm. So how are we going to help them build leaders when we're trying to build change agents, they're trying to build social architects. Isn't that cool? Uh, I've got a paper on this. It's in the source. Uh, it's a whole discussion. There are, this plays out in many different uh, practical ways, how we communicate, on and on and on. This difference between East and West in the conception of leadership, of the nature of leadership. It's really fascinating. Um, and so, so where does that leave us? We have two, which one do we choose? <laughs> and isn't that beautiful when we do? Embrace both. And, and so leadership is primarily, uh, my understanding is leadership remains primarily movement. That is the nature of leadership. That, that's what it means to lead. But as you, see the Western is so often is, well, God's told us to go do this, so we're going to go do it. Let the chips fall where they may. Right? That's a very Western approach to vision or to leadership. You know, we don't care what we break, you know, break things quickly, that sort of thing. And so when we're conscious of the Eastern <coughs> conception of leadership, it's really beautiful. So then we're helping people move, but we're doing it in a way that actually is relatively harmonious. We're really giving attention to the care of the people, not just the achievement of the vision. Often Western leaders, we achieve the vision, doesn't matter who breaks in the process. Doesn't matter who we run over, because the vision is the thing. And so when we join these two culture, cultural conceptions together, to me it's really beautiful. Yes, we stay focused on the vision. Yes, we must achieve it. 
Yes, there is movement toward the vision, but as we do that, we're deeply caring and concerned for the quality of the people, for the quality of the relationships. We're not just riding over them to get the job done, whatever the cost. Does that make sense? So it's a beautiful uh, way of holding that tension. See, see, we're not trying to resolve it. We're not going to the eastern one. You know, forget the west, that's wrong. We're not going to the western one. This is the right one, forget that one. We're holding both. Very beautiful. Because of course we see that, in the, we see both in the scriptures. We see the movement, we see the change agent leader, but we also see a deep concern for the life and the health of relationships and of the body. A central concern, not peripheral. A central concern. Is that cool? So it's a beautiful example. Here are some others. This is my current collection. You see on page uh, 52 and 53. I literally collect these things. I have a file, I have a Word doc that is leadership tensions. I literally do. And as I think of one or experience one, I add it to the list. So this is the current state. We'll run through these very quickly, but these are fantastic. This is where you live, guys. This is where every leader lives, in the middle of these tensions. Should you be in the stands or on the playing field? Which one? Should you be focused on the long-term big picture or the short-term details? Wow. What if you just focused on the long, you know, you say, well, I'm a visionary leader, and so I'm just long-term big picture. What's going to happen to your work? It's going to collapse, man, because nobody's bringing lunch. You know, you're so visionary and long term and big picture. No one's got anywhere to stay. Do you understand? You will fail. Is, this is a good one. I got this one from Ted Ward. He, he gave me this one. Is leadership control or is it empowerment? Uh, using the word control in a positive way here. Which one? Wow, it's both. You have to have both. So, so don't get idealistic and say, well, leadership is always only ever empowerment. It's not. There are many times where you must maintain control. And if you don't, it's going to fall apart. The wrong person is going to take over unless you keep control. The wrong vision will come. Yeah, all sorts of things will go wrong if you don't keep control but not all the time. Then you're controlling. Is that cool? Yeah. So it's a tension. And, and there's no like quick, easy formula for what do I do in this situation? Do I control or do I empower? Yeah? yeah? This is the art of leadership. And Mary? also why the primary thinking habits is looking at God. Amen. Yeah, this is why in all of these uh, thinking habits, the primary one is looking at God. So I'm in the situation. I, I'm, I'm like, should I control or should I empower? You, th there's not necessarily a uh, quick, easy formula for determining which one I, do I do in this situation. So I've got to look at God. Lord, help me. You know, get up in the stands. Ask God, how do I understand this situation? What should I do? Should I be cracking down on this? Should I be letting him go? It's not one or the other. It's an art. Do you support the people or do you challenge the people? Beautiful one. Should your procedures be standard and rigid or should they be flexible? You must have both, some of each, yeah. For me, guess which one I like. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really good with rigid ones, but I do theoretically at least recognize that there is a place for them <laughs> once in a while. Rarely. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, give attention to ministry or family. Which one? This is a big, this is a huge tension uh, all over the world for leaders. We need to face this and walk along leaders uh, as they wrestle with this and struggle to, you know, figure out how do you do this. This will never be solved in the sense of we've solved it and, you know, we'll never have a problem ever again. You will struggle with this all your life as a leader if you're actually doing something for God that's real. Uh, am I a leader or am I a follower? Especially second generation, like the mid-level. You know, the young men and women, yeah? Especially. What are you, leaders or followers? You are both. 
And, and not only are you a fire-breathing, visionary, powerful, amazing leader, you must also be a very good follower, a very healthy follower for the mothers and fathers that God has given you. That's so healthy. It's so healthy. It is so protecting for you. It protects you. Not that your mothers and fathers are always going to be perfect. They'll make mistakes too. That's fine. Uh, we just got to forgive them when they do. But a lot of the time, they actually will have, they'll be right. Simply because they've been around for a few more decades than you have been. Decades, guys. They've been doing this stuff for decades. Yeah? Uh, do we focus or do we detach? The next one's interesting. Are we aggressive and full of faith and vision or should we be prudent? This is the question, Mercy, that you asked me in the break time, you know. Which one is it? Should we be, God's told us to do this, so we're going to, you know, just dive off and do it. Or should we be prudent and figure out, you know, do we have the capacity for doing this, actually? Or do we just charge on and trust God? Well, sometimes you charge on and trust God. Sometimes you need to say, I'm not charging on until I know I've got the capacity. Again, at the middle, looking at God. Yeah? Is that cool? Uh, do we allow people to make mistakes and learn from them? Or do we protect them from failure and pain? Because there's pain that comes when we make mistakes, isn't there? There will be pain. So, so maybe we should just protect the people because we love them and care about them. What do you think? Which one? Yep. This is the art of leadership. This is the art of building leaders. Sometimes you need to... Uh, allow your emerging leaders to fail. You know they're going to fail. And don't let them kill themselves or somebody else. You know, it, it, you know if it's that level of failure, you need to stop in, uh, stop and, uh, you know, dive in and pre prevent it. Uh, but, but also, we need to, whatever is the opposite of whatever I just said, I forget. <coughs> we give them... <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> yeah, allow them to make mistakes. Good. Yeah, it's both. Isn't this cool? This is so healthy. When you think this way, when you think according to tensions, because different people have different personalities. Some of you, very fire breathing, aggressive, you know, you'll be like, we're just going to let them fail and that's how they'll learn and we're just going to charge on whether we have the capacity to do it or not. Others of you, much more gentle, much more, uh, you know, concerned about people and everyone's doing well and uh, cautious about do we have our ducks in a row, you know? And, and what happens in a team is we look at one another and we can be frustrated with each other because we think, well, I'm thinking this way, you're thinking that way, and it's got to be my way. No, it doesn't. We need to respect one another, respect that each of you is a gift. You're a gift to the other one. Amen. Amen. Listen to each other. We'll come to that later. What's that one called? Which thinking habit? Thinking. Interdependent, interdependent thinking. Exactly. This is where the power lies because God's made each of us so differently. Different gifts, different callings, different personalities, different orientations, on and on. There are so many differences. That's not a problem. That's fantastic. That's a tremendous gift from God. Next one. Uh, do we wait on God? Uh, oh, no. No, this is just a waiting on God while avoiding passivity. That's attention. Waiting on God. The temptation is just to become passive, but we've got to maintain, uh, be active. Do we have realistic expectations or do we pursue God's highest? Which one? We need both of these. We need to pursue God's highest while having realistic expectations. Yeah. Then you'll stay sane. <laughs> Face reality. Yeah. It's okay. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, not strong in faith for you to, um, for you to have realistic expectations. This is, next one is a beauty. Making decisions with some information but not enough. You'll never have all the information you need. Never, never, never. You've got to move anyway. At some point, you've got to say, I've got enough and I'm going to 
make a decision the best I can, knowing I may be wrong, but you've got to make that decision and move ahead. Yeah? yeah. Decision making is a big deal because you will never ha know everything. Do we plan well or do we follow God step by step? That's a good one, isn't it? Personally, I'm a major planner. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Thank God we have people on our team who can plan. Do we recognize our practical limitations or do we trust God for the impossible? See, see, don't lump that thing on people that in everything you've always got to be trusting God for the impossible. No, you don't. It's okay. You need to face the reality, face the limitations that, that, of, of where you're at and, and look to God that somehow He's going to get you through that to accomplish His will. Absolutely. But don't just, don't just think one-dimensionally. Is conflict good or bad? Yeah, it's a good way to look at conflict, isn't it? Where's the opportunity here? Ooh. Uh, where are we? Protecting people, safety or building people, risk. Embracing suffering while believing God for His provision, protection and blessing. We believe God for His provision, for His protection, but we also recognize He will allow the righteous to suffer. And we simply embrace that ambiguity. We embrace it. This is so important for me. I had a son who suffered a terrible illness and lost his hip. No hip joint. And for several years I quit praying for people because I couldn't embrace that ambiguity of can I trust God? Can I not trust? Should I just yep. relax and rest in what God has allowed in my life or should I resist it? And somehow I've got to be able to, to take both of those concepts yep. and accept them not in balance, but in tension. fully accept both of them yep. in proper tension. Amen. Do we take care of the present or do we prepare for the future? Which one? You'd better take care of the present or there will be no future. <laughs> Seriously, that's the reality. Don't be this idealistic head in the clouds leader that you know all you see is the future I know that's where the fun is I know I could tend toward that myself but we have a lot of responsibilities in the present do we take action or do we trust God to do it do we love and accept people as they are or do we lead them in a change isn't this a great list do we see quantity or quality you don't have to choose the next one is cool uh, I, I picked this up from somebody recently. I read an article. I forget what it was, but I just grabbed this idea. Do we grow people or build people? Are we gardeners or carpenters? Isn't that beautiful? What's the difference between gardener growing people and carpenter building people? What's the difference? What do gardeners do? They nurture, they, f they plant, and then they feed, and they let it grow by itself, yeah? But of course they come and they prune, and they water, and they fertilize, and they care for the thing, but, but they sort of let it happen. Build, what does that imply? Very intentional design. Intentionality, design. John? Planning, designing, yeah. Yeah, you don't really plan much about how to grow this, you know, flower do you yeah. I mean where it what sort of flower it is where you're gonna stick it that sort of thing that's not much mm -hmm. but when you're building a house mm -hmm. you everything you know it's all every piece of it is all laid out you know high level of intentionality so it's the idea of intentionality that I love about build it's the idea of design see I years ago I chose build as our primary metaphor rather than grow I could have chosen grow they're both biblical by the way they're side by side. In, in fact, Paul weaves them together. Yeah, he goes back and forth between them. Jesus is the cornerstone, God gives increase. Yeah. Uh, how about the difference of building involves more intervention and more of things that we do 
growing, yep. you plant the seed and if yep. you keep trying to intervene, yep. you'll, you'll kill it. <laughs> God makes it grow. Exactly. It's beautiful. So do we grow people or do we build people? Yeah, we do both. We're both carpenters building the temple and we're gardeners in God's field. Yeah? Is that cool? So it's great. You don't have to choose uh, um, unless you want a title for your book. You know, then you do have to choose. And so I was like, it can't be building and growing God's leaders. And so, so I intentionally embraced the image of building because... The core of our ministry, our little piece of the puzzle, is the intentionality, the design. It, it's the models, you know? Uh, and, and so that's why I chose the, the metaphor of build. James. My question is then the, the timing, the when, the season, the timing is the to do both. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. That's the point. Uh, but so you, as, as a, a, a strong, wise builder and grower of leaders... In touch with God, looking at God, embracing the fact that they're both true, then by God's grace, you'll know what to do at the right season. Sometimes just let people go. Let them go. God's, God's growing them. The, the plant is growing. You know, but then you've got to come back later and you've got to do a little, a, a little work. You know, it's okay. Yeah, embrace it all. It's very rich when you do this. You know, you're not limited to just one image. Is that cool? Leader development and leader care. That's excellent. Which one is it? It's both, isn't it? Good. I, I think it's, it's not always both. It's always depending on the context. So you choose yeah. which to the both Good. according to the context. Uh, so you always have a choice. And yep. sometimes when you choose both, it's wrong. When you choose one, one, yep. one item, it's yep. wrong. Yep. The other yep. item is wrong. Yep. So it depends on yep. the context. Good. You're always in tension of both. You're always embracing both, but you need to move over this way in a certain situation, you need to move over this way in another. Yeah, but you've always got both in your mind. And so this becomes a beautiful framework for you in understanding what you're doing as a leader. Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? It's a beautiful tool. And, and see, see, we're talking about thinking habits. This is the internal world of the leader that you're living here knowing there are these ambiguities and you're weaving in and out of them all the time. Really healthy. As you do this, it will really improve the quality of your leadership. Should, should I be task-oriented or people-oriented? Yep. Yep. Oh, so many, aren't there? Task or people, uh, time or event. You know, or... or all, all the yeah, or all, uh, all of the culture. You know the the the, the dimensions of culture. You know these are because different cultures go to different sides of tensions in in various things. Uh, yeah. No, I I see a lot of guys struggling with uh, the huge large group of people I need to influence or the model of a few yep. leaders and right. build deeply. And actually, yep. I find a lot of guys don't have the tension. You actually should have the tension. You know what I mean? Which so, side do they go to? I mean, they're just doing the group stuff. And they feel overwhelmed with that. So yeah. they hear some of these great ideas about building leaders, but they're not struggling with that tension. They're just giving in. And, and so they end up doing what? The large group all the time. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, in in yeah. other words, that's the norm. Just, tensions don't just come to you. Sometimes you want to be intentional to say, Am I leader caring? Am I building? Am I resting? Am I working super hard? If, do I have a small group of people I'm working with and a large group? It, it's kind of evaluation, isn't it? Yeah, 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 constantly. Um, yeah, and often training ministries do go for the big numbers, you know, because, hey, then we're succeeding. Look, we, we did a big event, and uh, you, know, you see this with Western ministries. We went to country X. We had a meeting for three days with 5,000 leaders. We trained 5,000 leaders. No, you didn't. You, you can't train 5,000 leaders. I, I'm sure you inspired them. No problem. And that's good. Uh, you, th there was probably some good learning that occurred. There was some encouragement. All of that's good. But you did not build their lives. Num for two reasons. Number one, you don't build somebody's life in three days. You just don't. Num Jesus took three years. You're going to do it in three days? Number two, 
you don't build leaders 5,000 at a time. Jesus built 12. You're going to build 5,000? You're like, what's the number there? 50 times better than the Lord Jesus at building leaders? <laughs> I think not. Yeah. So, but there's pressure. There's pressure on ministries because we want the numbers. We want to impress people. You know, this sort of thing. Years ago, years ago, we made that choice of doing it as Jesus did it. Not obviously far from perfect, but focusing on a few. That is a core reality. Focus on a few. Do something small for God. You know, th th there's all this religious pressure. Do something big for God. No, do something small for God, but do it real. And so that's what we did. Do you know, when I first started training people, you know how many I trained? Have a guess what the number was. There was two. Two. Two people, both of whom I led to the Lord. I took uh, seriously my responsibility to train. This was 40 years ago when I got saved. I started teaching two. Two. And I was really diligent about it. We'd get together once a week and I would teach them the Word. I hardly knew anything about the Word, but I was teaching two. Two people. I was really happy, delighted. I took it very seriously, and they're my responsibility. That's how we've got to think. If you're too big to teach two, I don't want, it, I don't want you teaching 2,000. <laughs> Amen. If you're too cool and you know, too, too much of a big shot to, to really deeply invest in the lives of a few. Uh, but the amazing thing was that over the years now, God has given us uh, such a huge impact. It's extraordinary. And, and now, like last year, you know what? You know the number of people in our trainings, at Leader Source trainings, last year in one year? Anybody know? 28,000. And it's not because we're trying to do something big. We're not. All of those trainings, are, they're all small. Uh, I think they're all small trainings. You know, they're, they're small things. We're trying to really invest deeply in people's lives. So, so we've proven that it works. Invest in a few. Leave the numbers up to God. If what you're doing is real and, and it's effective and, and life-changing and Christ-centered, He'll take care of the numbers. He cares a whole lot more about the numbers than we do. Yeah? Because they're people for whom He died across the nations. Yeah? He does. But what He's given us to do is build a few and build them well. And when you do that, you'll end up impacting the lives of many. It's the mustard seed principle. Smallest of all seeds, yeah? That's the kingdom of God. It's fantastic. But when it's grown, it's this huge tree. Yeah. Cool.